Now, I thought I would uh, start by quickly introducing myself for those of you I haven't met yet. Name's Ian, and uh, this is my, I'm starting my second year here at the Institute. And uh, my field is that of mathematical physics, or more specifically, statistical mechanics, which is it's trying to find global properties in systems of many particles. And I'm going to try and give you a, an idea of what I mean by that with uh, an example here that is uh, uh, taken from a project that, uh, that I've been involved in last year, which is about liquid crystals. Now, liquid crystals, I'll tell you a bit more about what they are. It's a, it's a phase of matter that, has, uh, that exists naturally and in the lab and that has interesting and, and uh, intriguing properties. Now, but before I, I begin, let me mention that everything that I'll be talking about is joint work with Elliot Lieb from Princeton University. He's sitting here in the audience today. And uh, that, uh, this is, uh, that the result that I'll be presenting has been put up on the archive fairly recently, about a week ago. You can find the archive number down here if you're interested. Also, as, uh, as um, I usually do, I wrote down the URL for my, my website here where you can find that, that archive preprint along with my other preprints, the source code for the preprint, the source code for the figures in the preprint. These slides are also on the website along with the source code for the slides and the source code for the figures in the slide. So if you want to check that out, uh, you can have a look at that. OK, without further ado, liquid crystals. What are liquid crystals? Well, the, the term itself sounds self-contradictory because crystals typically are characterized by order. The atoms in a crystal are typically periodic. They have a periodic structure and they are therefore um, ordered. Whereas in a liquid, the atoms or molecules are disordered. They're decorrelated from each other. Now, a liquid crystal lies somewhere in between, somewhere in the middle between order and disorder. It has some properties of ordered materials and some properties of disordered materials. Uh, let me try and give you a a more precise picture of what I mean uh, by telling you, at least pictorially, what a liquid crystal is, what, what liquid crystals are made of. Well, they're materials whose molecules are much longer than they are wide. They're typically very elongated and straight. So I drew this uh, in a pictorially here. So every ellipsoid here represents a molecule, and they're all long and rigid. And these, these sorts of materials, they exist in nature. There's a, a virus, it's called the tobacco mosaic virus, that uh, affects tobacco leaves, that is, uh, is surprisingly straight and rigid and, and cylindrical, which is a good, good example of a liquid crystal. There are many more that can be made in labs and so forth. And now, what makes a liquid crystal a liquid crystal? Well, that's, it's the arrangement of the molecules uh, in, in the material which both exhibits properties of order and disorder. So let me tell you about that. The order, you can, which you, you may be able to see kind of from this, this uh, pictorial depiction, lies in the orientation of the molecules. These molecules are long, they're sticks, and they're all pretty much oriented in the same direction. There's some, some fluctuation, but they're pretty much all, all pointing in the same way. That's the order part of a liquid crystalline phase. Oh, I should mention what the phase that I'm talking about here is called a pneumatic liquid crystalline phase. There are other ones that I won't be, I won't be talking about today. Anyways, that's the order part. But at the same time, there's disorder because the positions of the molecules is not regular, is not ordered, it's not periodic. If you look at the statistics of the, of the locations of the centers of each of these molecules here, you'll see no long-range correlations. So. At, on, on the one hand, you have order in the orientation of the molecules and disorder in their positions. Now, since it, this is the important part of the talk, I'm going to reiterate uh, and, and say it clearly that in a pneumatic liquid crystalline phase, you have order and disorder. The order part is in the orientation of the molecules and is usually called long-range orientational order. Now, long-range here, uh, means something fairly strong. If I have a sample, then it's this, this uh, alignment, this uniformity in the orientation of the molecules will persist over my entire sample. This means billions upon billions of molecules that are, are at, at enormous distances from each other somehow know in which direction they, they need to point. 
This is they're all pointing in the same direction or they're all locally pointing in the same direction? They're all pointing in the same direction, Global. globally. So this depends on the dimension. I'm talking about 3D here. In 2D, there's going to be there's going to be some shift. But yes, this is. Uh, and at the same time, there's no positional order, which means that the locations of the centers are disordered, which uh, which means that the molecules can flow one against another. There's no no constraint on where they can go. And now these properties they have macroscopic consequences. The fact that there's no positional order means that my material behaves like a liquid. It flows. I can put it in a bottle. I ha can have a droplet of liquid crystal. It behaves like a liquid. But at the same time, this long-range orientational order creates uh, an interesting interaction with light, with the electromagnetic field. The way that these, these materials interact with light is typically non-trivial. And particularly, they, you can play around with polarization and with, uh, with um, uh, well, mostly polarization with with light. And this, uh, this property here has uh, made them fairly interested, in, in, interesting in the, in the technological world. And they've been used to build displays. Now, you may, you're, you're probably all familiar with uh, the little displays on, on digital watches. Those are liquid crystal displays, which is the same as a display you'd find in a pocket calculator. But more recently, they've developed uh, flat screen computer monitors based on liquid crystals, flat screen TVs based on liquid crystals. And in fact, the, you may have heard the term LCD. LCD means liquid crystal display. So any LCD works based on, the, on these, uh, these materials. So what this means is that, these, the, that liquid crystals, they're, they're uh, useful. They're also interesting from a, from a theoretical point of view because of this notion of having order and disorder at the same time, uh, which is, is a somewhat intriguing property. And so the question that I, would, that I would propose today is, well, to try and understand why liquid crystals are the way they are, why these phases are the way they are. And what I mean by that is, can we find a mathematical model that will adequately represent the dynamics, of, the dynamics on the molecular level from which we can prove properties of liquid, of, of liquid crystalline phases. And the first property that I'll be interested in is the very existence of the liquid crystalline phase. I want to show, I want to have a model for molecules and show that these molecules spontaneously align, but don't spontaneously, uh, that, but their positional order remain, their, their positional degrees of freedom remain decorrelated. Okay? So let me take you back to the, the 1970s. In the 1970s, this was, a, this was an open problem to find such a model for which one could prove such a thing. And uh, I would like to talk to you about a paper by Ole Heilman and Elliot Lieb from 1979 in which a model, actually several different models, but I will only focus on one for this talk, and so in which a model was introduced that would represent in some idealized way dynamics of of liquid crystals on a molecular level, and which could be a good candidate for which one could prove the existence of the liquid crystalline phase. Let me tell you what this model is. It's a two-dimensional model, first of all. And it's a lattice model. The molecules are constrained, uh, are constrained to the vertices and the bonds of a square lattice in two dimensions, which I drew as the background down here. It's just a Z2. Now my molecules I represent by these little, little black sticks that are of length 1 that occupy an edge and the two neighboring vertices. These are called, in the physics literature, dimers. Right? They, they're dimers. The die comes from 2. They occupy two sides. So these are my molecules. And since they occupy edges of Z2, so the, that's exactly what I, I was about to say, exactly that. Yes, they can be either horizontal or vertical. There are two or orientations, two and only two orientations. Now in addition, and this it turns out is very important if I want a liquid crystalline phase, I introduce an interaction between, between my molecules, which will be an attractive, interactions that, uh, an attractive interaction that will favor alignment. So if you want to wrap your head around this, you can imagine that each of these little sticks is actually magnetized. And as you, you know, magnets, they like to be aligned. They don't like to be orthogonal to each other. They like to be, they like to be uh, uh, parallel, collinear. So in, an, in a more precise setting, the way that I define this, I say that whenever I have an event 
like this one here, in which I have two dimers, or so two molecules that are adjacent and belong to the same row or to the same column, then I get an attractive interaction, which I represented here by a, a red wavy line. OK? So I haven't really told you what the model is. I told you what the objects are. These are, these are what the, what the molecule, how the molecules are represented. Sorry? Yes, that's right. So none of these dimers are allowed to overlap with any other dimer. Exactly. That's very right. And in particular, not only can they not coexist on the same edge, they can't share a vertex. OK. Now, the way that I'm going to approach uh, this model, what I'm going to compute with this model, are thermodynamic observables which are, are a certain class of, of observables that I can compute that are properties of a probability distribution on this, this model. So let me tell you a little bit more <laughs> about what I mean there. So what I want to study, so I, I want to make this, uh, these uh, configurations of molecules random with some probability distribution, and I want to study the properties of this probability distribution. Let me define this, uh, let me define it here, so first of all, it's called the grand canonical Gibbs distribution. It's something that would, be, that would typically be considered when one is, is looking at equilibrium statistical mechanics models. And it's defined in the following way. It depends on two parameters, which is there's a parameter z, which is a non-negative real number that's called the activity. And it depends on a parameter j, which is also a non-negative real number. It's called the interaction strength. And the probability is proportional to the activity to the power of the number of particles in the configuration times e to the j times the number of interactions in the configurations, by which I mean the, the number of pairs of particles that are adjacent and belong to the same row or the same column. And then I have a, a normalization here to turn this into, into a probability. This normalization is called the partition function. And so this is the probability distribution that I would like to uh, that I would like to study. In, specifically, in order to have a liquid crystalline phase, I want to focus on a regime of parameters so that is such that the activity is large and the interaction is large. So let me, let me give you an, an intuitive picture of what this means. If the activity is large, since my probability is proportional to the activity to the number of particles, this means that I'm going to give a larger weight to configurations that have many particles. Right? If I have lots of particles, then z to the number of particles will be larger. And so the, the, pr the probability of those configurations will be higher. Similarly, I, I'm also going to take the interaction strength to be large. In fact, for technical reasons, it has to be larger than, than the activity. Uh, and this means that the probability of, uh, of a configuration in which I have lots of interactions, lo lots of events where my dimers are adjacent and belong to the same row or column, are favored. That's the regime that I'm interested in. Now on this model, Hyman and Lieb in 1979, uh, yes? Okay. How can you imagine the number of particles changing? I mean, I can imagine that they rearrange the number of interactions change, but aren't you given a number of particles? Right. So, um, so what this is, this is, um, I'm doing statistical mechanics in a so-called grand canonical ensemble, which means that I'm, I'm, not, I'm not fixing a number of molecules and having them move around. I'm considering an ensemble of different configurations, of, all, of, of possible configurations, where the idea behind this is that from a macroscopic level, you don't actually know the number of particles in your system. So you want that to be a variable. You don't want to make any assumptions on it. So it's not a... So this, in certain settings, this could happen. It depends on what, uh, what I'm looking at. Here, my, my lattice is going to, uh, is, has certain boundary conditions that is such that this cannot happen. But this is something that you could do. But this, so in term, statistical mechanics terms, this would make it non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, where you're injecting something into the system, and you want to see what happens, how that propagates. Here, I'm interested in an equilibrium model. Which is uh, which mathematically defined by taking the, the probability distribution that I that I um, that I, I showed in the previous slide, and 
uh, from a philosophical standpoint or from a physical standpoint, uh, it means that I'm considering a that I'm considering a family of configurations as possible configurations with different weights depending on how likely I believe these configurations would be, and trying to understand properties of this of the configuration itself. So the fact that the number of particles is variable comes from the fact that I don't know how many particles I have. That's right. That's right. So in order to make this, you may have noticed, uh, if I'm on all of Z2, this cannot be well defined. I can't normalize this because this diverges. So what I do, there, I, I, I take a box, I put this on a box, I define the probability distribution, then take the limit. There are theorems that work in, in large generality that show that, that I can indeed do this. Thank you. So let me just quickly mention uh, this, right? So Hyman and Lieb in, in the, the 1979 paper, they did two things. They proved a theorem and stated a conjecture. The theorem states that there is long-range orientational order in this model. More specifically, more precisely, what, what is stated is that if I take a site on my lattice somewhere down here, and I take another site somewhere up here, I look at the probability of having a horizontal dimer pointing out of this site and having a horizontal dimer pointing out of this site. They show that this probability is large, that in fact it goes to 1 in the j, j and z goes to infinity limit. So this is saying that if I have a horizontal dimer somewhere, it's likely that if I look anywhere else, I'll find another horizontal dimer. So for you, j was much bigger than z. Yes. Is that true for them? No, you, yes. So yes and no. The regime that they, that they considered uh, is a different one. If I remember correctly, if I look in the, in the zj plane, they're looking at something. Now, what is it? I don't remember. There's some, some curve here that, uh, that they're considering, that they're looking at a region that's, that's here. So it's j is larger than z. Z is not necessarily large. There's a, a number of um, so the 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 region that it's, is treated in this paper is larger than the re region that we can treat in our in ours. So this is long range orientational order, which was proved in this 1979 paper, and then they uh, they made the conjecture that in this model there is no no long-range positional order. This would make it a liquid crystalline phase. A liquid crystalline phase has long-range orientational order and no positional order. More specifically, more, more specifically, I can state the conjecture as saying that if I look at an edge down here and another edge all the way out there, the probability that both edges are occupied by particles should be, to a certain extent, independent of the position of the, of the edges. Or uh, what actually e happens is that this probability is independent of the location of the particles up to some term that decays exponentially in the distance between the edges. And uh, now this, uh, this conjecture was open for a while. To be fair, there were other models that, were that have been introduced since for which, um, for which liquid crystalline phases have been proved. But this specific, uh, for this specific model, it hadn't been done until, until last year, Elliot and I uh, revisited the problem and, uh, and found a proof of, the, of, of this conjecture here, of the fact that there is no positional order in this model, thus showing uh, the existence of a liquid crystalline phase in this model of interacting dimers. Now, just one very last thing. Um, it's nice, I'm happy about this result, but a cave, an important caveat is that it's an idealized model for what a, a liquid crystal would be. In particular, the most important uh, restriction that it has is that the number of orientations of the molecules is finite. And as of yet, there are no models, no, no let's say, natural models for the molecules in liquid crystals with continuous positions and continuous orientations for which the liquid crystalline phase has been proved. And there actually are fairly compelling reasons for why this is, this would, is a difficult thing to do. On that positive note, I will thank you. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. <laughs>